Hi gentle and of course very modern apes, welcome to another episode of the Library of Error. This is the series where we take certain texts, usually ones written by young earth creationists, and we examine them for their robusticity. It's a really fun time. Today we are continuing on with season two, episode two, covering chapter two of Contested Bones by Sanford and Roop, who are seeking to overturn paleoanthropology. And spoiler, again, neither of them are paleoanthropologists. So really, really bodes well. <laughs> um, I'm excited to get started today. I've got my tea, I've got my water. And um, I did look at some of the comments on the previous video, I actually read all the comments that I get. They very frequently make my entire day. I, I love them, they make my week. Many of them are very kind. Some of them are a bit snide, but mm, it's YouTube. What do you expect? And specifically, I was looking for answers to the question that I posed at the last video's sort of ending, near the ending, asking you guys if you could think of any scientific field which was overturned in its paradigm by a complete outsider with no training in said field. Now, I received a lot of comments, but none of them were quite what I was looking for. Some um, some of you proposed Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, who came in and basically, you know, revolutionized aspects of microbiology. But again, this isn't overturning what was previously known. This is adding to an existing body of literature in a in a very important fashion. Right, so what we're looking for here is someone who is coming from outside of a field, who has no training in it, who waltzes on in there and then flips the table on the field, showing why it is incorrect in many different ways. The point being is that I can't think of any examples of this because in order to overturn a paradigm, you typically have to understand it quite well which is why young earth creationists, they don't tend to inspire confidence as these great overturners, given they so frequently misunderstand and misrepresent what evolutionary theory is actually trying to say and how it is proposed to work. With that stipulation, please again, let me know if you can think of any examples. I also got a lovely comment telling me that I need to never, ever, ever eat or drink on stream again. And this is probably coming from someone who doesn't know the sordid and rich lore of this channel and who doesn't remember the olden days in which I would eat perhaps one of the worst possible foods on stream, which is raw pasta noodles. This was when I was living in the UK. And while I loved living in the UK, it isn't known for its excellent snacks. So I did, in times of desperation, break into the raw pasta and it turns out microphones really pick up on that crunching sound. And when you have a large resonant nasopharynx like I do, it's extra loud. So to that person who said, don't eat and drink on stream again, I say, let's get started. of you who are perhaps wondering, the intro song is called The Mind Electric by Miracle Musical, and I'm saying that, and I'm gonna start saying it every time, because people never stop asking, even though it is listed in my channel trailer's description. So, say la vie, it's okay, it is a pretty good song, so I understand why you guys want to know. So, picking up where we left off, I'm very excited, we are beginning with Chapter two, which is titled A Theory in Crisis. Of course, this is referring to evolutionary theory. So let's find out why the 
foundational idea behind all of modern biology is in fact in crisis um, and by association human evolution paleoanthropology is in crisis from two people who aren't paleoanthropologists. I'm really excited. I'm sure there's a lot of excellent, correct information in here. Um, certainly no joker moments. Let's begin. We begin with a quote. Even with all fossil evidence and analytical techniques from the past 50 years, a convincing hypothesis for the origin of Homo remains elusive. This is a quote from Bernard Wood, who is in fact a paleoanthropologist. Now, if you're just listening to this quote outside of context and you are not perhaps well versed in human evolution, you hear Homo and you think, oh, this is a quote that Bernard Wood is making about the origin of Homo sapiens, right? Wrong. Homo is a genera right, or a genus, genera being the plural. So Homo is a genus, Homo sapiens, our genus and then our species. A genus being Homo, species being Homo sapiens, of course. And Bernard Wood is actually discussing the origin of the genus Homo, right? So he's talking about finding a convincing series of hypotheses that explain why Homo, the genus, became differentiated from the Australopithecines that were already in existence. We know this because the source comes from an article by Bernard Wood titled 50 years after Homo, <clears throat> excuse me, 50 years after Homo habilis, which is the first species that is thought to be a member of genus Homo, a member of our genus. This thing had a relatively small brain case size, postcrania, fairly modern, fairly derived, uh, but still pretty prognathic, lots of very primitive features. Some people think Homo habilis actually belongs in Australopithecus. I'm not convinced. That be, it still has some very grass out features that are, are more derived than its Australopithecus counterparts. Um, point being, Sanford and Roop are taking a quote that is referring to the origin of a very small portion of the entire story of human evolution, of the entire lineage, and are applying it, the, the uncertainty about the pressures that led to genus Homo to human evolution writ large, if that's what, I think I'm using that right, writ la as a whole, right? Um, this should be concerning because it means that they either don't know the difference between the origin of genus Homo versus the origin of Homo sapiens, of humans, or they're doing it on purpose in an attempt to mislead you. Um, to, be, to make this as clear as possible, this would be like me reading a quote that's like, we are not 100% sure what pressures led to the origin of the genus Canis, of which wolves and dogs and other kind of... Um, familiar, not familiar, familiar canines belong to. And then I say, see, this quote supports the fact that we don't know where modern domestic dogs came from. It's inapplicable um, and myopic. So with one sentence down, let's continue. <laughs> Darwin's prediction. Darwin knew that if his theory of evolution was correct, the fossil record should show innumerable intermediate forms reflecting countless gradual evolutionary transitions where species were continuously morphing into other species. You should be worried when someone uses morphing as a, a verb like that. Morphing tends to be restricted to its, its kind of um, root, so morphology, um, things like that. When it's used like this, it kind of sounds like it's being understood like a mighty Morphin Power Ranger or like an Animorph, both of which are not analogous to human evolution. I hope I don't need to say that. However, no such transitional fossils were seen in his day. Wrong. I just wrote wrong on the side. Darwin was alive for not only the discovery of Neanderthals, but also Archaeopteryx lithographica, two very popular, well-known transitional forms that we still consider key species today. How they missed that, I don't know. <laughs> then they have a quote. Why then is not every geologic stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such fine graduated organic chains, and thus perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Um, this is Darwin from The Origin of Species, which was written in the 1800s. I don't think that it's applicable now because paleontology effectively didn't exist when Darwin wrote that paragraph, right? Hard to find transitional forms when no one's been looking for forms of any kind in the fossil record. 
but I digress. <laughs> We're gonna see a lot of this. We're gonna see a lot of like old quotes. I know I said that last time, but really we should have a running tally. Maybe I'll put a running tally of like quotes that were pre-2000. We'll give them 20 years. <laughs> Uh, for Darwin's theory to be true, there would need to be countless transitional forms linking all forms of life into a single organic chain. In theory, yes. In application, no. No one expects the fossil record, nor has anyone ever really expected the fossil record to be an accurate representation of all biodiversity because of a little field of study called taphonomy. Taphonomy is the study of how things die and preserve. And as we know very well, and as these guys know very well because they say it, all the time trying to prove that critters can only fossilize if there's some big water event, like, oh, I don't know, the Noachian deluge, that creatures won't fossilize. It's an uncommon process to just occur. The conditions have to be right, whether it's preserving in something like a peat bog or a eutrophic lake or being covered by something in like a flash flood type situation or a mudslide, right? These events tend to be rare, which is why we should never expect our fossil record to have every single representative of every single species that's ever existed. And this is unimaginably tragic, right? Because there are innumerable forms of critters that we will never know because they'd never fossilized. No member of their species fossilized. So you can let that soothe you to bed tonight as you're sitting in the darkness of your room. I know I shed many a tear about this prospect. Darwin predicted that fossils of countless and missing transitional forms would eventually be found. It has been 150 years since Darwin's time, so if he was correct, there should now be a great multitude of transitional fossils. Excellent news! There are! However, this has not happened. For example, the late Stephen Jay Gould, evolutionary paleontologist at Harvard, confessed we're going to get a lot of this um, loaded usage of words, things like confessed, admitted, that are kind of spinning the narrative in such a way that contested bones feels makes it look a little bit better. Um, here's the quote from Gold. The extreme rarity of transitional forms of the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that draw in our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. So here's something that's interesting. This quote from Stephen Jay Gould is from 1977. And in 1977, we had about three or four hominins. We have well over 20 now. Um, so I would propose that the field of paleontology and thus paleoanthropology has made innumerable great strides since 1977 when Gould, quoted, when Gould is quoted as saying this. Even still, you'll, you should note that Gould says the extreme rarity of transitional fossils not the absence of transitional fossils, as is proposed in the immediate sentence prior by the authors of this text. This feels a little sussy-wussy, as one might say, as the kids might say. I have a younger sister. She keeps me cool and hip. Leading paleoanthropologist Niles Eldridge and Ian Tattersall had a similar thought, saying, 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's prediction. So think to yourself, if just previously they said 150 years since Darwin, and this quote says 120 years, do a little math there, right? Boop, 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 and you'll find that this is at least 30 years out of date. Lo and behold, it's from 1982. So again... <laughs> We're not working with great support here, and a firm reminder that this text was written in 2017, so there is no excuse for using quotes this old that are talking about an area of study that constantly changes. This would be like taking something like medicine or genetics, something that changes every week, every day in some areas, and using quotes from 40 years ago to back up the idea that genetics and medicine have gone nowhere since the 80s. It's really, really dumb. But I digress. Although transitional links are generally missing, it's still widely claimed that the instance of ape-to-man evolution has occurred, I suppose. There is really 
Is there really valid, compelling fossil evidence that proves this transition? Are these claims valid? There is no question that since the time of Darwin, there have been many determined people, again, we're loading the language here, who have found, who have searched for missing links between ape and man. Bones have indeed been found, and some of these bones have been held up as ape-human transitional forms. A casual examination of textbooks and mass media seems to suggest that the hominin fossil evidence is now abundant and compelling. Not only is it abundant and compelling now, it was abundant and compelling 20 years ago, but we're not using sources as recent as 20 years ago. No, no, we have to go back 40, 50. There's a quote in here that's from, or there's a, yeah, there's a quote in this text that's from like even earlier. You'll see, I don't want to spoil it. Um, a casual, okay, blah, 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 blah. All right, this book will show that the theory of human evolution has the following profound problems. So before we get into these problems, and we're not going to address these problems here because if we did, we wouldn't have anything else to analyze because these this is kind of the thesis statements of the book. But before we go, I want to, before we move on to these, I want to sort of underline a couple of themes that we've seen pop up in this text so far. Theme number one, outdated sources, of course, obviously. Theme number two, loaded language, yes, obviously this is the case. Um, and theme number three that we're going to get to here in just a second is a gross misunderstanding of how this field actually works. We've seen hints of it so far, we're really gonna see it right here. Um, and when I say this field, really I mean biology as a whole, as well as paleontology, taphonomy, paleoanthropology, primatology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, let's just get into it. I really just want to kind of jump into this, and uh, and you'll see what I mean. I'll explain it as we go. Um, but keep those other ones in mind because they will continue to be a problem. Number one. The history of the field of paleoanthropology consists of a long series of bone discoveries, each of which initially appeared to suggest a transitional form leading to man, but in each case has either been debunked or at least has become contested. So the ones that have been debunked include one, and it's Piltdown Man, right? The ones that are contested, and again, this is going to be a theme as well, one of the themes that I'm talking about, about not understanding the field as a whole, is that these guys, when they say contested, as in the title of the text, Contested Bones, they mean any time there is a disagreement about any aspect of a fossil find, any aspect of a transitional form or of um, a species as a whole. So for instance, if we're talking about the find of Lee Berger <clears throat> of hominin Australopithecus sediba, and Lee looks at Australopithecus sediba and says, I think that the spine of Australopithecus sediba indicates extreme lumbar lordosis, just like modern humans. And then someone else comes along and says, it's fine that you think that, Lee, but I think it's only moderate lumbar lordosis uh, and more transitional in between an Australopith's level and uh, earlier Australopith's level and what we see in, in things like Homo erectus. That would be considered a contested bone, even though they're not disputing human evolution and are actually disputing a, a the minutia of a single find, right? Um, so with that in mind, every sentence in science is contested because there is always someone who is going to disagree with some aspect of it. Are you starting to see the issues foundationally with this text? If what I just said is true, then every single fossil find in human evolution is technically a contested bone. This is going to remain a problem. <laughs> Number two, the history of the field has long has been a long series of just-so story, with each new story invalidating the story before it. Also, no. <laughs> These guys think that every single time someone comes along and says, ah, yes, I see that you've proposed the savanna hypothesis, where one of the benefits of bipedality or an organism, a hominin standing up, is that it can survey the landscape, and I raise you the woodland mosaic hypothesis instead, right? That doesn't mean that the latter supersedes the former, although in my opinion, the woodland mosaic hypothesis is, is better. I do think that hominin evolution began in the woodlands. It just means that there are competing hypotheses for the pressures that led to certain hominins evolving certain traits, right? 
and I, I have an analogy for this. I'm going to put a pin in it, and I'll remember. Trust me. Okay, number three. As more villains have become discovered, the basic story has not come into clear focus. Rather, the story keeps getting more convoluted, more confusing, and more contested. The result is an evolutionary tree that experts refer to as a messy, tangled, undecipherable bush. This speaks of a field in disarray. Messy, tangled, undecipherable bushes in quotes... There is no source for where this comes from. So I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you who actually these guys think called that. Whatever. It's fine. It doesn't matter. I would actually propose that the human evolutionary tree is indeed a very bushy, messy, uh, convoluted lineage. Because we have so many critters living contemporaneously, evolving and succeeding in slightly different ways in this, you know, open savanna niche. That, uh, that, it, that exploded as the Eastern African Rift Valley changed, right? So yes, as we find more organisms, the story becomes more complicated. You know that whole concept where like the true indication of knowledge is you realize how little you know, because it turns out all things are in fact very complicated because they have so many variables to them, right? These guys want human evolution's actual reality to mimic, like, the very simplistic graphs that we show little kids in, like, elementary school, right? They want the simple explanation to be indicative of how things actually happen. That is never the case. This is why we effectively lie, quote-unquote, to little kids when we teach them things like um, the conventional model of the atom, right? Like, that's not what an atom actually looks like with the little balls in the middle and then the rotating balls orbiting around it, making up the electrons... Uh, and the neutrons and protons, respectively, right? That's not how it actually works, but we tell them a simplistic story to prepare them for the complexities that will later emerge. But that's, that's the reality that these guys expect from human evolution and no other field, mind you. Okay, even the most credible hominin fossils are contested in terms of their place in the human evolutionary tree. That's number four. Um, mm, Yes and no, they are contested with regard to their place, but not as in like, oh, we don't know that human evolution is occurring. It's more like, is Homo heidelbergensis, which specimens of Homo heidelbergensis will eventually yield which lineages of Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and uh, Homo longyear denisovans respectively? Again, it's the minutia that is contested, that is argued, as it should be, as it is, in every other area of science, period. That's a sign of a healthy field. There are only two meaningful genera. This is number five. Australopithecus, southern apes, and Homo, humans. <laughs> there is no clear evidence of a transitional bridge genus. I love this one. I genuinely love this one. This is indicative of that problem number three I mentioned earlier, where they have no idea how evolution works. Because if we had this bridge genus, right, between Australopithecus and Homo, they would be asking for two additional bridge genuses, bridge genera, excuse me, between Australopithecus and the bridge, and then the bridge and Homo, right? It's always asking for every single organism on the chain, right? The reality is that the bridge genus is Australopithecus and Homo and moving backwards in time, Ardipithecus and Sahelanthropus, all the way up through the rest of the Miocene apes, through our, our Aegyptopithecus, our, our, our um, early old world monkeys, through the Omamyids, uh, Plesiodapa forms, all the way back to the first single cellular organism, Luca, right? Those are all bridges because it's a chain of being. No link is more important than any other link. And the reality, of course, is that late Australopithecus and early genus Homo are almost indistinguishable from one another. The bridge between Australopithecus and Homo is late Australopithecus and early Homo. That's where the morphology shifts. But these guys do not understand that, right? Um, the, the example here would be like, if I'm trying to go from red to yellow, orange is the transitional color, right? Is orange closer to red or yellow? It's like a mix of both, no? So, orange in this case would be our late Australopithecines and early Geosoma. Number six, the ape-like Australopithecus precursors did not significantly precede man. I, I don't care. That's the, um, the Tyler the Creator okay meme. It, it, that does not matter. 
They appear to have coexisted with man until the Australopiths went extinct. No, Australopithecus as a genus appears far, far earlier than genus Homo, and while they do exist contemporaneously at points, it's primarily Paranthropus, which is uh, colloquially considered an Australopithecine, as in a robust Australopithecine, but is a distinct genus that has always been considered to be a sister group to uh, the Australopithecines that would eventually yield genus Homo. The problem here being that this indicates that the authors don't know the difference between Paranthropus and Australopithecus as genera. We will see if that pans out later, but I'll tell you now that it does. <laughs> Okay, next one. The methods used to date most hominin fossils, such as potassium argon dating, massive red flag. Potassium argon dating is like not typically used for this. It's usually argon argon dating, right? Uh, has been shown to be unreliable when different dating methods are used to date the same sample. The resulting dates typically do not agree. Therefore, signed dates can be misleading and in serious error. So here's a little interesting tidbit about this section. Um, you have to pick one if you're a young Earth creationist, right? Conceptually, you have to pick one. Either dating methods do not work at all, and therefore you can't show that the Australopithecines and genus Homo were contemporaneous, or alternatively, the dating methods do work, and they were to some de degree contemporaneous. Oh, and that's a problem, right? You can't have both, uh, but here they are right next to each other, not right next to each other, being used as um, subsequent arguments against human evolution. <clears throat> of course, the reality of this is that, yes, dating methods do work. In fact, the entire fossil fuel industry that runs our global economy relies on radiometric dating working. And radiometric dating works the same whether you're basin modeling to find natural gas or oil, or if you're dating sediment that contains a fossil. So every time you fill up the gas in your car, you are validating conventional science in an ancient earth as well as the, the methods used to date fossils. Okay, full stop, period. Um, and we can also ch double check this with actual examples, right? We know from historical records when Mount Vesuvius erupted, the volcano that killed everybody in Pompeii, and we can also do argon argon dating on Mount Vesuvius, on a material uh, ash beds from Mount Vesuvius, and we find that you can get it through the calendar year. So awesome, that's really great. We know that radiometric dating works. I'm sure we'll tackle that when we get there. But I'm just highlighting the inconsistency so far with these two arguments. Next up, new discoveries in the field of genetics make ape-to-man evolution virtually impossible. Furthermore, there's strong evidence that deviant forms within Homo genus, the Homo genus, appear to manifest various pathologies, such as erectus, Homo erectus, uh, and hobbit, Homo floresiensis. Remember that I'm adding the actual nomenclature in there. Keep that in the back of your head. These guys can't be bothered. These deviant forms do not necessarily reflect pre-humans, but rather seem to reflect genetic degradation associated with inbreeding and accelerated mutation accumulation. If that sounds remotely coherent to you, uh, or at least even a little bit scientific, it's because it's, it's completely disguised in jargon. This is referring to genetic entropy. Genetic entropy is a creationist reskin of a concept called error catastrophe, and it is Sanford, the plant geneticist uh, author of this text, his bread and butter. He wants to show that all critters are degrading from this perfect created form, and he's using that idea to bolster this idea that mutations can't actually carry um, your ape-like common ancestor to your modern apes that we see today couple of problems here. I've talked about genetic entropy a lot on this channel, but I've also gotten a lot of new subscribers. So some of you may not know genetic entropy, what it is, why it's problematic. I will include a lot of links in this, this ugh, ugh, in, this, in the description. It's just making me get tongue-tied because I'm so angry. It fills my mouth with battery acid and agitates my tongue. Um, I'll include links in the description that explain it further, but all you need to know about genetic entropy and the reasons why it doesn't work is because they have to change the definition of fitness to make it work. So <laughs> fitness, one of like three core concepts to evolutionary theory other than mutation and natural selection, right, has to be changed to invalidate evolution. 
which is again no longer evolution because you change the definition of fitness. So fitness is just in reference to how many how many organisms uh, you can reproduce, right? Uh, or rather, how many offspring you can produce as an organism, right? Um, and your fitness is impacted by mutations being acted upon by natural selection, right? So if you change one of those three definitions, as genetic entropy does, it's no longer evolution. Like, full stop, it's just not. So already, boom, we can just cross out genetic entropy, it is not even on the table. But secondarily, just for a little bonus, just as a treat for you guys, they also have been for, they being young earth creationists like Sanford, have been forced to admit that evidently genetic entropy doesn't work on bacteria. <laughs> one of the biggest categories of life is not actually um, subject to genetic entropy, which is supposed to be a core problem with evolutionary theory. Evolution, of course, which acts on all of life, which would effectively mean that evolution is true in their eyes for bacteria and nothing else. I will leave you to mull over the logistics of that. Okay, does the fossil record support the concept of ape-to-man evolution? The traditional view of human evolution has been pictured as a simple family lineage, something like the iconic March of Progress, where a series of ape-like creatures become progressively more human as they march through time. At the time the image was created, blah, 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 no one actually likes the March of Progress anymore. Like, it's a pretty outdated general idea. Hmm. So I'm going to skip some of this March of Progress bashing because I tend to agree the March of Progress is not a good representative of human evolution or of evolution in general. Um, okay, at the time, the thinking was that Australopithecus afarensis simply evolved into Homo habilis, which evolved into Homo erectus, which evolved into early Homo sapiens. Um, no. <laughs> I regret to inform you, it is not that simple. Uh, Ernst Mayer championed this view in the 50s and 60s, and it became deeply entrenched. However, over the past few decades, new species have replaced um, previously species that were previously imagined to be transitional forms, excuse me, uh, and the idea of a simple linear progression has been completely abandoned. The traditional straight-line view of human evolution is officially dead. Someone needs to tell Tim White that, because he's still proposing this anagenesis idea of Ornithopithecus ramidus to Australopithecus anamensis to Australopithecus afarensis. No one thinks this. They are actually correct, but the traditional view of this linear human evolution was abandoned very, very, very early on. In fact, the March of Progress wasn't even really appreciated when it initially came out. And the reason for this is because anybody who knows anything about evolution as a whole knows that it doesn't occur anagenetically like that, right? Um, it's, it's much more complicated. You have organism right here, right, that's mulling along, moving, minding its own business, and maybe a split occurs. So now there's two organisms. And one organism changes locations and is subject to new pressures and evolves into something that will eventually be considered a different species, its population does. And the original still mulls along, right? It's not like the previous organism's population had to go extinct to yield this separate split-off population that would eventually, through natural selection, become something new or yield something new, right? Okay. Okay, so he's getting mad. They're getting mad about um, the March of Progress still. Um, after a century of fossil hunting, oops, hold on. After a century of fossil hunting, the picture that has emerged is chaotic. That is true. That's true for human ancestors and human evolution, and that's true for dinosaur evolution, and it's true for cetacean evolution. The problem is that we have too many fossils and placing them in this way that is nice and linear has become impossible because what we can see very clearly is this gradient of change from more basal organisms to more derived organisms but which species and population yielded which subsequent population is unknown right there's too many options this is a good problem to have most of the major finds that have been historically headlined have later been rejected by leading experts in the field or the paleo community as a whole. There's another ulcer. This includes the famous bones referred to as Neanderthal Man, Piltdown Man, Zinge, Lucy, Habilis, Artie, and Hobbit. Even the very recent finds of Sediba and Naledi have quickly been ousted from the direct human lineage. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. So, 
there is not a direct human lineage that is proposed, right? There is no direct lineage. That idea, as admitted, I'm using that loaded language there, by the authors of this text, that has been abandoned for quite some time now. So no, these haven't been proposed and then rejected. They never, we were never proposed as members of this direct lineage, uh, with the exception of some major, very broad species. Like, for instance, Homo erectus is almost certainly on the direct line of several later hominid species because it was so flipping ubiquitous. Um, now, Neanderthal man, that is a legitimate species and a legitimate specimen. I don't know why that's on the list. Piltdown man, fraud, true. You know who discovered it was a fraud? Paleoanthropologist. Number three, Zinge, this is in reference to Paranthropus, always considered a sister species. No, it has not ever been considered on the direct human lineage. Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, still considered by many to be an excellent candidate for something that is on the direct human lineage, or at least is very similar to what was. Homo habilis, considered to be, again, either on the direct human lineage or something very similar to something that was, perhaps something like Homo rudolfensis. Ardipithecus ramidus, if this thing isn't on the direct human lineage, it's similar to something that was because it is, you couldn't ask for better transition with regard to the acquisition of, of bipedal locomotion, we'll get there. And the Hobbit, Homo floresiensis. No one ever thought that this thing was anywhere even close within a stone's throw of the direct human lineage. It's a species of three foot tall um, hominins that have been around until relatively recently that lived on an island. Um, very clearly an example of a previous hominin that experienced insular dwarfism. Okay. Even recent finds of Sediba, Australopithecus Sediba, and Naledi, Homo Naledi, have been quickly ousted from the direct human lineage. Neither of those ever were. All right, <laughs> these were found when, you know, when I was looking into this stuff. And I can tell you, no, the only one who perhaps would propose it is Lee Berger. Um, and he's not even proposing that his specimens are directly. He's saying it's possible, right? Okay. <clears throat> the list of debunked human ancestors can be expanded to include more obscure species not widely known to the public, such as Australopithecus africanus, Auroran tugenensis, Sahelanthropus chidensis, and others. I don't really know what to say there. I don't think those are that obscure. If you are like even vaguely aware of human evolution, you probably know these specimens. And no, none, none of them were ever considered to be directly on the human lineage, with the exception of perhaps Sahelanthropus chidensis, because its species is considered to be by some the last common ancestor of humans and chimps. The status of nearly every hominin species and its hypothetical place on the human lineage has been subject to continuous revision. That's true. That's how science works, again. Um, while some have argued that Homo habilis is a legitimate taxon, others now argue that it is a wastebasket species and should be scrapped. Wastebasket and scrapped are both in quotation marks in this sentence with no citation. So that's excellent. We need to talk for a minute about what a wastebasket taxon means because these guys don't know what it means, which should again be concerning. You, this is just a whole book where every sentence is a red flag. So a wastebasket taxon is referred to as a wastebasket taxon because things get thrown into it, hence wastebasket. It doesn't mean that the fossils aren't real, and it doesn't mean that the fossils aren't on a lineage per se, right? It simply means that it isn't well-defined. That's all. And thus it deserves and warrants some more clear definition. Homo heidelbergensis is generally considered to be a wastebasket taxon. We have so much material from this species. The question is whether or not um, we can actually distinguish Homo, or sorry, uh, excuse me, Homo heidelbergensis from what would become early Homo neanderthalensis, early Denisovans, early Homo sapiens, etc. Uh, but no one considers Homo habilis to be a wastebasket species pretty much besides Lee Berger. Why, you might ask, does Lee Berger consider Homo habilis a wastebasket species? And why does he think it needs to be better defined? Because Lee thinks his own find of Australopithecus sediba is the root of genus Homo. When he was first trying to publish, he called it Homo sediba. So there is a bit of motivation there, in my opinion. Okay, but the point is, is that all of these hominin species, just like Darwin predicted, and perhaps in the most detailed and exquisite way of any lineage that I've ever seen, 
displays the slow morphologic change from a basal ape-like ancestor to derived human-like traits seen in uh, later hominids, more recent hominids, including our own species. Who actually yields who? We don't know, and we probably will never know. But not being able to construct a direct lineage, <laughs> something that you have to have genetics to really do, does not eliminate <laughs> human evolution. In fact, it, it actually, as I've said many times in this video already, is a nice problem to have because it means you've got too many dadgum species to, to work with to decide who yields who. Okay. While some argue that Naledi is a non-human animal, so he's talking about Homo naledi, different species than Australopithecus sediba or Homo habilis, others argue it is simply a variant of Homo erectus and is therefore fully human. This is a mess of a sentence. There is no one who thinks that Homo erectus is fully human, okay? There are a scant few paleoanthropologists who would propose that anything in genus Homo is effectively, should effectively be considered one species simply because um, there's, there's li very likely the ability to interbreed in kind of like a ring-like species analogy with one and its direct predecessor and its uh, direct subsequent uh, descendant. I say scant few because I don't, I've never met anybody who thinks that, right? Obviously, it would be absurd to say that Homo erectus, some members of which have brain case sizes in the 600 cc's, half of what the modern human brain case is, is fully human in the sense that this species is actually a member of Homo sapiens. That's asinine. No one thinks that. Again, even these people who think that we should just really lump a lot of species together would also argue that all of Australopithecus should be a single species. I doubt that these guys would find, would be that consistent. Oh boy, okay. Um, okay, some argue that Hobbit, Homo floresiensis, is a new species of Homo. Others argue it's a disease, modern human. No one argues that, and this was completely punted back in like 20, like maybe 2009, I believe. No one thinks that. Okay, while some argue that Australopithecines were bipedal hominins, others say they were essentially apes and spent most of their lives in the trees. We will get to this. There is absolutely no argument to be made that Australopithecines weren't at least highly habitual bipeds. There, that is completely indefensible. What are we to make of these contested bones? Perhaps an ongoing debate is the sign of a healthy field of science. We can close the book. We're done. Because <laughs> it is. Um, I wish. Wouldn't that be nice? However, if a field persists in chaotically changing its claims and cannot firmly establish its own fundamentals, this is not evidence of scientific progress, but is evidence of confusion. There is a foundational difference between, foundational theory did there, between, um, not knowing what the fundamentals of a field are and that field not having fundamentals. Right. I'm just saying. It's something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, it appears that the paleo experts, ouch, can't get their story straight because they really can't make sense of the hominid fossil record. Is it possible that the field is in disarray because they're starting assumption apes morphing into humans? That's a real sentence that's in this text is simply wrong. There appears to be only one firm consensus in the field. The human fossil record does not reveal a clear linear progression from ape-like Australopith to man. Again, you would have to like, you would have to never even pick up a text on human evolution to come away with that or have some serious um, motivated reasoning, if you will. Apes morphing into humans is a very humorous sentence and sentiment. It's a nice, funny little clip. Um, that's really what I think creationists think that human evolution is. But again, anatomically modern humans are apes still. There is nothing about us. There is no trait that apes, the rest of the apes have uh, collectively that we don't also have, right? So this you could write this as like evolutionists think that canines morphed into dogs, which would be very silly for reasons that I hope I don't need to explain. The next section is titled Strong Doubts Expressed by Leading Experts in the Field. Now, 
I know that all of the quotes, all of these doubts expressed by experts in the field are going to be honest portrayals and not at all warped misrepresentations of what they actually said or meant. Wink. Textbooks in the mainstream media mislead the public by presenting the fossil evidence as if there are no serious controversies, suggesting that we know for a fact ape to man evolution happens. That's a problem with pop science in general, which is why every time a new hominin or primate period fossil comes out, uh, they tend to be like human evolution, completely rewritten, right? And it, 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 that's never actually what's happening, but it is what gets clicks and human evolution or paleoanthropology is definitively and objectively not the only field that this happens in. <clears throat> Standard biology textbooks throughout the world show family tree of our evolution from hominin ancestors over a period of time spanning some six to 10 million years. For example, figure one is from an introductory level biology textbook currently used in numerous colleges and universities. Notice the advancing stages of human evolu or of evolution from the earliest ape-like creatures from the Australopithecines to modern Homo sapiens. The general pattern sh resembles the famous ape parade studied earlier, discussed earlier, except this time marching ape men are replaced by illustrations of actual fossil remains, mostly skulls. The reason skulls are used is because typically they are they illustrate the concept most evidently of this slow morphologic change occurring over geologic time. The impression given to students is very clear. Human evolution is backed by a wealth of fossil evidence and no real science that no real scientist could question. Um, true. Very, very based sentence there. We could just cut that out and have one page and that's all it says <laughs> in this whole text. In reality, many scientists, especially when the field question what the fossil evidence shows, um, they, they argue about the minutia. Again, we're remembering these themes of misrepresentation, ancient quote minds, uh, and loaded language for this text of contested bones. Students in the general public are not told to take that the evidence taken as a whole looks very different than the stylized figures we see in the textbooks. This is because it isn't remarkably different. Um, Okay, then they note, <laughs> they're mad that there is this illustration and they say in this little blurb here at the bottom that only one question mark is shown in the whole thing. How is there only one question mark? Uh, it is not intended to cast doubt on human evolution, on the hum on human evolution in theory. That's just a bad sentence. I thought that this book was supposed to be, you were the chosen one. You were supposed to be better than why human evolution is false <laughs> uh, with the typos. Um, and they're, they're basically mad. They, they think that there is, they don't understand that this x-axis here is not meant to show directionality, but just how these creatures through geologic time, which is here on the y-axis, how these organisms are going from more basal to more derived, right? Okay. Leading experts in the field are the first to acknowledge that there's a serious lack of fossil evidence in support of the ape to man story. Then they have this quote from Richard Leakey and David Pillbeam that says, biologists would dearly like to know how modern apes, modern humans, and the various ancestral hominoids, I was trying to say hominid and hominoid at the same time, ancestral hominids have evolved from a common ancestor. Unfortunately, the fossil record is somewhat incomplete as far as the hominids are concerned and is all but blank for the apes. This is true. We'll, we'll, touch, on, we'll touch on that in just a second. The best we can hope for is more fossils will be found over the next few years, which will fill the present gaps uh, in evidence. David Pilbeam comments wryly, <laughs> okay, uh, if you brought a smart scientist from another discipline and showed him the meager evidence we've got, he'd surely say, forget it, there isn't enough to go on. Um, at, at this point in the side chat, see if you can guess the decade that this quote comes from, because I'll give you just, you know, one two, three. It's from 1981. So yes, I would say were I living in the 80s that the hominin fossil record is quite sparse, <laughs> um, especially compared to this year of our Lord some 60 years later. <laughs> um, is it 60? 40. I'm an idiot. You just remember that. Okay. Yeah, I wrote 1981 up here. <laughs> The extreme uncertainty regarding the lineage of man can be in a surprisingly transparent article of National Geographic, which shows two charts on human evolution. This article provides a more honest portrayal of the fossil record, and they basically show the exact same graph that's found in the textbooks, except there are question marks 
for how these populations, these intermediaries between each species have changed. Because remember, it's never good enough to have, you could have a hundred transitional forms, right? From species A to species B. And creationists will say, it's not good enough unless you can show me how species 50 turned into species 51, right? You're always at least one transitional species shy of giving them what they want because they do not have a, a um, stable goalpost. It is this thing is on wheels, right? Moving back and forth. Um, because to round off what would actually be sufficient and to outline that to paleoanthropologists or indeed biologists as a whole with regard to evolution would be to subject yourself to potentially being given what you asked for. And they can't have that. Okay. Um, with many thousands of fossils found since then, the situation has not improved. How, <laughs> how does that work? Um, I mean, that, like, the analogy there would be like, we don't have enough money. And then it's like, well, we've been given millions of dollars, but the situation of our not having money has not been improved. Like, they just got done saying there aren't enough fossils. And then they're like, now there's a lot of fossils, but the situation is no better. Uh, Wood published an, order, an updated tree diagram in 2014. Oh, good. So three years before this text was actually written uh, and before, uh, excuse me, Homo naledi was actually discovered. Awesome. In the place of question marks, Wood now shows an equivalent number of broken, disconnected branches. He admits the picture has only become more obscure, more uncertain, and more convoluted with each new discovery. Yes, with regard to the specific lineages, this is true. It will only continue to get more convoluted the more fossils we find, because creating an exact lineage when there are so many options to choose from at every single level, it, it becomes quite difficult. Okay, and then they have a, a repeated quote that we've already been over. Okay, with an ever-growing collection of hominin fossils, the picture that has emerged is anything but ape-to-man progression. That's, again, just not the case. On the 200th anniversary of Charles, Dar Charles Darwin's birthday, paleo-expert... There's another one. Richard Klein showed the tree diagram in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Similar to Wood's latest depiction, there are question marks and dashed lines at every major evolutionary junction. If we filled in those junctions, Sanford and Roop would want to explain the dashed lines between the new fill-in transitional and everything before it and everything after it. Because again, that, I can't stress enough that it's never good enough for these guys. It wasn't good enough when we found the first ape man and here, you know, 16, 17 hominins later, it's still not good enough. It never will be, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> but fortunately, conventional science doesn't know that these guys are even still bobbing around, so that's the good news. Paleoanthropologist Ian Tattersall, the emeritus curator of the American Museum of, National, of Natural History, now expresses similar doubts. Here's the quote. Even allowing for the poorer record that we have of our close extinct kin, Homo sapiens appears as distinctive and unprecedented. There's certainly no evidence to support the notion that we gradually became who we inherently are over an extended period, either in the physical or intellectual sense. I think it's time to go mini mode because I have actually, as it were, investigated this quote. And I'd like to show you where it comes from, as well as the sentences immediately preceding and immediately succeeding it. So the quote that Sanford and Roop take comes from Masters of the Planet in Search of Our Human Origins by Ian Tattersall. From this chapter, chapter 14, in the beginning was the word. And I'm going to go ahead and read this whole little section and you can appreciate exactly what Tattersall's position is. Um, and then we'll compare it to the rest of the things that Sanford and Roop have already mentioned. So, in biological terms, the birth of anatomical Homo sapiens may be as much as 100,000 years before the first Nasarius bead was ever pierced was a huge event. We differ from our closest known relatives in numerous features of the skull and of the postcranial skeleton, in important features of brain growth, and almost certainly in critical features of the internal brain organization as well. This is a big almost certainly, but this was done in, I think, 2014, so we've gotten a lot done since then. These differences exist on an unusual scale. At least to the human eye, most primate species don't differ very much from their closest living relatives. Differences tend to be largely in external features such as coat color, ear size, or even vocalizations, and variations in bony structures tend to be minor. 
I would also contest that, ha, huh, just a little bit, because many primate species that probably can interbreed won't, simply because they don't recognize one another as potential mates, right? So to them, these differences are quite large. Just because we can't appreciate the scale at which these differences exist doesn't mean that they don't exist. <clears throat> In contrast, and even, this is where the quote from Sinford and Roop starts, in contrast, and even allowing for the poor record we have of our closest extinct kin, Homo sapiens appears as distinctive and unprecedented. Still, we evidently came about our usual, unusual anatomical structure and capabilities or capacities very recently. There is certainly no evidence to support the notion that we gradually became who we inherently are over an extended period, either in the physical or intellectual sense. That's where the quote ends, and note, critically, that this section right here, we evidently, or um, excuse me, Homo sapiens appears as distinctive and unprecedented. Still, we evidently came about our unusual uh, anatomical and structural cap capacities, excuse me, very recently. So this whole section is taken out, right? Um, because very recently in the, or in the paleoanthropologic sense is like 300,000 years or so. Um, so and then it ends here, but Tattersall continues. As I've already observed, this suggests that the physical origin of our species lays in the short-term event of major developmental reorganization, even if that event was likely driven by rather minor structural innovation at the DNA level. Such an occurrence has been made more plausible by the fact that genetic innovations of this kind that probably produced us are more likely to become fixed in small and genetically isolated populations, such as those into whose climatic vagaries would regularly have fragmented our already thinly spread African forebears. In other words, conditions in the late Pleistocene would have been as propitious as you could imagine, propitious, pro yeah, propitious as you could imagine for the kind of event that would necessarily have led to underwrite the appearance of a creature as usual, as unusual as ourselves. So there are a couple of things I want you to note here. These guys are using this as Ian Tattersall saying that we have no explanation for the emergence of Homo sapiens they abjectly and objectively cut the quote off before Tattersall goes on to say, but we know this is something that's happened and we additionally know further that it probably didn't take very much change. If you read this book, you'll see that he uh, at least very vaguely gets into what kind of changes did or, or rather necessarily occurred, the kinds of pressures that may have led to them and the genetic support for these changes. Now, that's not the real interesting part of this quote being used by Sanford and Rope. To me, the, by far the most interesting part is that Ian Tattersall is talking about anatomically modern Homo sapiens, which he describes as very distinct from all other members of genus Homo. This is indirect, it is diametrically opposed rather to what Sanford and Rope hold, which is that all of genus Homo back to Homo erectus, are human. These two things cannot exist simultaneously. They're using Ian Tattersall's quote that Homo sapiens appears very quickly and very abruptly. Now, Tattersall is also meaning this in geologic time, which means Homo sapiens and a lot of the traits that, that are very distinct to Homo sapiens seem to appear 300,000 years ago. And over the course of seven to 10 million years of evolution, this is relatively rapid. But Sanford and Roop are using that quote to support their hypothesis. But their hypothesis doesn't just consider anatomically modern Homo sapiens human, which means the quote can't be used by them. Okay. These honest remarks expressed by experts in the field would most often be in private conversations or obscure books. Numerous expressions of uncertainty are found in the technical journals. All technical journals, journals in all fields of science necessarily use um, unsure language like this supports the idea or this suggests or perhaps this could mean because that's how science works science abjectly does not work in certainties um its mutability is what makes it great but they are generally not reader friendly or readily accessible to the public again i put this is every field in the side i am all for the open access science um, however, no trace of uncertainty is seen in textbooks or popular media. You can blame pop science if you want, but like textbooks are meant to simplify. Again, technically we lied to little kids about a lot of different science and a lot of different history because we're bringing it down to a level that they can understand to lay the groundwork for what they will eventually learn when their spongy brains are capable of actually working through the complexities of many of these fields. 
The controversial aspects about the hominin bones are largely hidden from public view. One is not allowed to question if ape to man evolution happened, only how it happened. Here's where I'm going to use um, my, my big brain analogy here. Human evolution would be a lot like finding a pyramid in the middle of the desert, right? You're an archaeologist, you're wandering around, you see this big fat pyramid in the desert, and you're like, wow, what a cool, intricate pyramid. It's dated to, you know, 4,000 years ago. That's incredible that humans made this. And in that case, you would not be allowed to question if that pyramid was built. It clearly was. It is ubiquitously right there in front of your face, right? You can question how it was made. How did these ancient peoples acquire the materials that they needed to build this pyramid? What processes were behind the building of this pyramid? But you cannot question if it was built because it so very clearly was. This is how human evolution works. We have such a glut of fossil representation from so many different time periods within the hominin evolutionary lineage that you cannot question if it happened. It objectively did. You can question how it happened, which is what the contested bones that Sanford and Rupert are referring to are. Questioning the minutia of the how, not the if. Okay. In our investigation of this topic, we have found that every major new claim that has been widely proclaimed to the public has been challenged by other experts in the field. Again, it's the minutia. In many, perhaps most of these cases, one of the competing views offered by paleo experts, I think that one was in the spleen, happens to line up remarkably well with our own alternative model. Of, they're talking about creationism there. <laughs> these competing views are not merely held by rare dissident or eccentric. Eh, rare dissidents or eccentrics. Typically, it is the leading authorities in the field who are expressing dissenting views in highly prestigious scientific journals, including Nature, Science Journal of Human Evolution, American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Plus One, and more. Yes, again, it's always a minutia. We will see this for ourselves later in this text. Why doesn't the public ever hear about the controversies within paleoanthropology? For the same reason that they don't hear about the minute disagreements that occur in literally every field of science because it's not exciting and they don't care. No one wants to know about the details of, you know, which kind of, of microscope slide works best when you're trying to examine, you know, a specific type of bacteria. That would be an example of contested microbiology in the eyes of Sanford and Roop. Um, and similarly, no one cares about the, the specifics behind the, you know, lumbar lordosis of a specific australopithecine. People who are interested care, and that's why they go to the technical literature. Okay. Um, this has created a false impression that paleo experts, there's another one, and are in general agreement with one another regarding all of the major claims. That is because that is true. The paleoanthropologists within the community are in general agreement about the major claims in human evolution. Again, as we'll see, it's always a minutia. This has, been, this has given the public a false sense of confidence in the ape to man story. People may ask, how could so many scientists be wrong? They are unaware that there are competing views within the scientific community regarding the interpretation of each of the reputed hominins and the fundamentals of the field. How much do you want to bet that the fundamentals of paleoanthropology and thus evolution and thus biology will not be covered in this text. I've already read it, so I can tell you they aren't. In Contested Bones, we will share with our readers the competing views, which are largely unknown to students, the general public, and scientists outside the field of paleoanthropology, so they're going to let us know the competing views. Interesting. Let's put that in the back of our heads. Our goal is to help people hear both sides of these controversies so they can make better informed decisions regarding the important question of where we came from. Now, both sides is going to be an interesting idea that is presented by Sanford and Rope. Because very similar to the modern world that we live in and all the kinds of political ongoings that are happening right now and public health ongoings, I'm trying not to be demonetized here, um, it's only a controversy if both sides can put forward very solid support for their idea, right? The Take climate change, for example. 97 I think it's actually 99 now, but we'll go with the, the more conservative number. 97% of scientists accepting climate change as something, sorry, anthropogenic climate change as something that is happening, their opinions all together as some one single, you know, amalgamation of climate change is happening, it's bad, and it's caused by humans, 
is not equal to the opinion of Joe Schmo, who lives down the street, whose education is in formal education is in like business, right? Those two opinions are not equal. Joe Schmo, smart as he may be, intelligent as he may be, and a critical, a good critical reasoner as he may be, is not on the same level as hundreds, thousands of scientists who are trained specifically in the field of the topic at hand. This is what Sanford and Rupp are going to be doing a lot of. They're going to be taking a fringe paleoanthropologist view, or as we saw earlier, uh, a creationist view, who is not formally trained in paleoanthropology, and they're going to be pitting it as if it is equivalent to the consensus in the field. That's not something you can do, folks. That's bad. That's, that's the kind of thing that triggers joker moments in me. Okay. In the next three sections of these of this book, we will examine in detail the bones of the eight primary hominid finds, eight, less than half um, hominid finds. In section one, we will examine hominid bones of the human type, Neanderthal erectus and hobbit, so appropriately, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, and Homo floresiensis. In section two, we will examine the bones of the ape type, Ardy and Lucy, so Ardipithecus ramidus and Australopithecus afarensis. In section three, excuse me, we will be looking at the bones of the supposed bridge species, Habilis sediba and Naledi, so Homo habilis, Australopithecus sediba, and Homo naledi. We'll conclude with an alternative model. Okay, at least they've laid out what they're going to do. Awesome. And now we have asterisk, asterisk, latest developments, fall 2017. We're going to have to talk about these. A series of milestone papers were published in late 2017 as this book was going to press. The findings summarized below have profound implication for the ape to man story and calls into question many major claims that have been made in the field since the 70s. Now, is it not very curious to you guys that all of a sudden we're worried about fines that have occurred since the 70s only when they appear at least in the eyes of the authors to provide something problematic to the eyes of the paleoanthropologic community so this feels a bit like cherry picking doesn't it it's okay though because it turns out the things that they're presenting aren't actually problematic let's get into it okay uh, these findings confirm blah blah blah. Yeah, these findings confirm that the ape to man story is a theory in deepening crisis and simultaneously confirms these uh, theses outlined in multiple chapters in this book. Number one, anatomically modern human looking footprints have been found in Crete that date to approximately 5.7 million years old. Veterans of the channel will remember that these are the Trichios prints, and I have talked about them a lot but let's talk about them a little bit more. This finding suggests that humans significantly predate our reputed Australopithecine ancestors. Thus, Lucy, Artie, Sediba, Habilis, or any other Pliocene hominin species cannot reasonably be our ancestor. <sighs> okay, so contemporaneity is going to be continuously proposed as an issue. It is not an issue. As I said earlier, a population can yield a new population that eventually becomes a new species without going extinct itself. So contemporaneity is like a, a hallmark of regular evolutionary theory. This is something these guys would know if they read anything about actual evolutionary theory. Um, but Let's, you know, correct them. Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, Ardi, Ardipithecus ramidus, Sediba, Australopithecus sediba, Habilis, Homo habilis, or any other Pliocene hominin species cannot reasonably be the ancestor because of these footprints that are 5.7 million years old found on the island of Crete, which is well outside of Africa, the pre-Pliocene hominin reigns, and so directly conflicts with the ape to man story. Yet these findings are remarkably consistent with our alternative model. I just wrote no next to this, but let's very briefly talk about the Trachios prints. I would like to show you the Trachios prints. Here they are. Here's a picture of some of these Trachios prints. Oops, didn't mean to clip that. Um, some of them, when taken in the right light, wow, well, they, they do seem to look like footprints, don't they? But I do think that it's important to appreciate one major factor with the Trachios prints that I actually didn't hammer home in my long, uh, you know, overly gratuitous video about it, and that's the size. Remember that Sanford and Roop just got done calling the Trachios footprints human 
anatomically modern human looking footprints. This footprint that you see right here is just over five centimeters uh, long, right? So, or rather, maybe around 10 centimeters long, right? Um, that's pretty small, okay? These are very small footprints. Um, specifically, here we go, let me find, uh, here we go. This is a paper by uh, Meldrum and Saramiento, the one I already went over. So Meldrum specializes in hominin foot morphology and Saramiento focuses on primate locomotion. So they are very apt to be discussing this. And they note, in spite of considerable size variation ranging from 94 to 223 millimeters, the author state, the tracks are of similar size and have consistent outlines across all specimens. Meldrum and Saramiento note that of the 28 prints that the original authors of the Trachios paper confidently identified as such, so the people who are saying that these are in fact hominin tracks, that 61% um, of them were less than 150 millimeters in length. So for the record, my cell phone is a little bit over 140 millimeters in length in its case, right? Um, so these, the footprints, are smaller than my phone. 61% of them are, and yet Sanford and Rupert calling them anatomically modern. Dingus. That is asinine. And it's very clear that they didn't bother to look into the literature on this. They saw a pop science article that said maybe hominin footprints in Crete, and they said to themselves, well, just like they told me, they must be anatomically modern human looking. They're child-sized, right? But that's not the end of their troubles because 18% are less than 100 millimeters. That's less than four inches long, gang. Curious, how strange. This would be notably small for a hominin foot, Saramiento and Meldrum note. By comparison, the smallest G1, smaller G1 footprints uh, at Laetoli measure 180 millimeters long. The nearly complete foot skeleton of Homo naledi, which is comparable to the smaller Laetoli footprints in size, is also much larger than the majority of the Trachios prints. Um, so not awesome. These guys also note that, um, and remember their credentials being prominent foot morphology and primate locomotion, Gierlinski, by comparison, while he is indeed, um, or why they are indeed an author on many trackways, not, they specify dinosaur trackways. So this should be uh, important, an important factor in considering uh, what they've put forward. Um, now they also, Gierlinski, or not Gierlinski, Meldrum and Saramiento also note that the ichnites, the proposed trackway, the proposed footprints also don't actually have consistent features of footprints. Um, specifically regarding their, meaning the original author's comparative morphometric analysis, the three most well-preserved footprints do not clearly show the 11 landmarks supposedly taken from 10 Trachea's footprints outlines, raising questions how questions over how landmarks were identified on the non or on the remaining non-figured seven prints making up the total sample. Um, and they don't, so they're inconsistent is, is essentially the problem. I'm trying to actually find a very specific um, quote here. We'll just go down to the, oh, look at these lovely prints. The three most well-preserved ichnites look like this. Uh, and then some of the other ones uh, look like, look like this. <laughs> Um, and vary, of course, again, greatly in size. So we'll go down to the conclusion here, just to refresh ourselves. In conclusion, even if these prints, as argued by Gierlinski et al., represent the footprints of a member of the human or great ape clade, we fundamentally disagree with the author's interpretation that the tracks would re represent a small primitive habitually bipedal hominin with hominin-like pedal digits and a ball combined with an ape-like sole lacking a bulbous heel. Although finding a bipedal trackway may shed light on the efficiency of the animal's, animal's bipedality and from this bipedal frequency inferred, it does not present evidence as to whether or not the animal is not a habitual biped, whether the animal is or is not a habitual biped. If accepted as bona fide footprints, the Trachios prints at best may suggest a tottering biped and do not present evidence of habitual bipedality. Moreover, the possibility, the possibly adducted position of the halix in just a few discernible examples of footprints may represent a transient posture that cannot be taken to be a hominin shared derived character. So abducted means the foot is away, or the big toe is away. Adducted means that the, the halix or the big toe is forward. <clears throat> They're noting that it is an inconsistent in inconsistent positions. And yet, 
Despite the fact that the tracheus prints are not, by consensus, considered to be, you know, a, a habitual biped 5.7 million years ago outside Africa, Sanford and Roop went to propose that they are, in fact, um, bona fide footprints. Uh, at less than four inches long, in some case, they are anatomically modern humans. That's really freaking stupid. So I, I hope that we can check this one off the list. Number two, as their 2017 considerable evidence that precludes ape to man evolution, uh, they note that Homo sapiens fossils from Morocco were assigned a revised age 315,000 years ago. Oh, you mean fossils can change dates? Like, no, no one in their right mind who's even, again, transiently aware of paleoanthropology thinks that when you find a fossil, that's the, like, end word on the range of temporal occupation of that species. That's crazy, right? The only thing that a fossil's age tells you is when that specific specimen lived, right? It doesn't give you the full range of when a species occupied uh, geologic time. So, but, but these guys think that that should, can and should never change. The Homo sapiens collection from Morocco predates what was previously seen as the oldest known occurrence of Homo sapiens from the Omo, uh, dated at 195,000 years old. This greatly exceeds the coexistence of Homo sapiens, sorry, greatly extends the, the coexistence of Homo sapiens with their reputed archaic forebears and contemporaries, including Neanderthals, Denisovans, uh, Homo erectus, uh, Homo naledi, and Homo floresiensis. Again, I added those in. This greatly confounds any claims of an evolutionary progression within the genus Homo. Dumb. Very dumb. <clears throat> and for a few reasons. One, the only one of those hominins that's being proposed as the specific forebearer of Homo sapiens out of Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans, Homo erectus, Homo naledi, and Homo floresiensis is Homo erectus. That's the only one that's being proposed and really has ever been proposed as the direct forebearer of Homo sapiens. Already horrible misrepresentation. Uh, but Homo erectus, let me just let me just show you this real quick. I wonder if this will include Dremelin. How long ago did Homo erectus live? So <laughs> this doesn't include Dremelin specimens, but 1.6 to 250,000 years ago is the range for uh, Homo erectus. And if you accept the Dremelin skull cap, this goes to being almost 2 million for Homo erectus. Uh, now, granted, the Dremelin skullcap is incredibly basal in many ways, uh, and the dating is unsure. So we can just take the current consensus at 1.6, um, and that has absolutely no bearing on a 315,000-year-old Homo sapiens skull, right? If 315,000 is the oldest, that doesn't touch uh, Homo erectus, which is the only one that was actually thought to be... Um, a, a direct forebearer. That means that they, they coexisted for like less than 100,000 years, which is not at all, in fact, that is directly in line with evolutionary theory and the idea of how populations change and evolve through time. Um, but that's not the only important thing about the Morocco skulls. The Morocco skulls are incredibly primitive, or the Morocco material is incre incredibly primitive. It's considered to be a primitive or archaic member of Homo sapiens. Evolution would perhaps predict that the oldest specimen of a species would be the most primitive specimen, at least compared to the ones that exist currently, right? If you're looking at something that's long gone and an extant member. So just for your pleasure, this specimen here on the left is a Morocco skull, and this is an anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Do you notice perhaps a few differences? This is not an anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Notice the sloping skull, this almost slight occipital bun-looking structure back here. It's more prognathic, it's got massive honking brow ridges. Um, overall, this is not anatomically modern. It is objectively archaic. And if you actually hop over to here, to here, you can see that in addition, it has a massively thick cranial vault compared to anatomically modern Homo sapiens. That's also a primitive trait. So no, the Morocco skulls, if anything, dramatically support human evolution by showing that the oldest specimen of Homo sapiens, and again, 300,000 years old, was 
shown to be the age of Homo sapiens, the first emergence of Homo sapiens, using the molecular clock first. So in this case, the finding of the Morocco skull corroborated the genetics, which these guys just got done dumping on in like two pages prior about how bad molecular clocks are. So they're really digging themselves um, a hole here, perhaps one that they will fall in and then fossilize and future creationists will be upset about. And the last of their new evidences that is problematic for to man evolution <clears throat> has to do with the Cerruti, I think it's Cerruti, Mastodon site. Of course they don't actually, they can't be bothered to give the actual site in the paper, uh, but that's okay because we can find it for ourselves. Here it is. Okay, the hominins in, the potential hominins in California, 130,000 years ago. Um, so this site, the, here it is, Cerruti, like I said, Mastodon site, Basically, what they found is a bunch of crushed bones and potential stone tools. They think they've got these things that they might be stone tools, and if that is the case, it would put hominins in California 130,000 years ago. So naturally, this was not <laughs> immediately considered to even be a possibility by most of the anthropologic community, and it turns out this is for pretty good reason. In this paper, they note that at least some of the factors of the site, uh, some of the stone tools, proposed stone tools, and some of the spiral fracture patterns found in the mastodon bones could have been done by things like construction equipment, because the site, Cerruti Mastodon site, um, or Cerruti um, Proboscidean site, um, had been subject to construction previously. They also note that uh, currently it is impossible for readers to evaluate whether the cobbles critical to Holden et al.'s uh, 2017 case could have been derived naturally from surrounding landforms or despositional settings. And then they go on to note that some of the spiral fractures that could not be explained by things like construction could have resulted from trampling, wallowing, or wallowing by large herbivores, including elephants, um, things like uh, proboscideans that would have been living in North America at that time. With evidence as ambiguous as broken bones, teeth, and nondescript broken or battered cobbles, it is not enough to demonstrate that the CML mastodon remains could have been broken or modified by humans. They must, authors must demonstrate that the bones could not have been broken by natural forces. The fact that some of the bones within the stratum were broken while others were not has little or no value as an indicator of the potential archaeological nature of this locality. So, no, this is very, very scant evidence. This is thin at best. Um, and the fact that no hominin or human remains have been found like older than 20,000 years in North America is just not helping their case at all. And the big heavy hitter for this is the fact that the genetic work that we have of haplogroups and things like that show that no, it doesn't look like humans were in North America um, that long ago. But that doesn't stop Sanford and Rue from proposing that actually they that all three of these events just are precisely what they need them to be to help discredit evolution when the first one, they're probably not footprints, the second one helps evolution, the third one is uh, the thinnest of the three, frankly. Um, and this was back in 2017, the Cerruti Mastodon, uh, the, the CML is not even being discussed at this juncture. All of the major paleoanthropological claims from the last 50 years are now in doubt because of these three things that we just went over and showed that no, they are not what Sanford and Rupe need them to be. But that doesn't stop them again from, you know, using these three select instances as the only recent material that they feel is necessary to cover. Otherwise, it's quotes from the 80s. Paleo experts, hmm, here it is can no longer be certain that the genus Homo evolved from the Australopiths. They can no longer say when and where the first Homo sapiens occurred. They can no longer trust in the techniques they've used to date hominin bones and artifacts. They've shown exactly none of those to be the case. But that ends the chapter for now. Um, I need to go see a physician to get these new ulcers checked on from all of the paleo expert usage. But I think that we can say, at least with a decent amount of certainty, that at this point in time, Sanford and Rube have not made their case. Of course, we have many more chapters to go, so we will wait with bated breath to see if these two non-paleoanthropologists truly do blast the paradigm to smithereens. Although since this was from 2017 and human evolution is paleoanthropology is trudging on unabated, um, I don't know that we're going to get that. <laughs> but my gentle and of course very modern apes, I hope to see you next time for another episode of Library of Errors. 
Um, it's the end of the semester for me, so I finally have quite a bit of time on my hands. So I hope to get a lot of Library of Errors out there, along with some other fun projects that are coming up. Uh, but in the meantime, do take care of yourselves.